My name is Nessa Cronin and I'm a lecturer in Irish Studies and Associate, Profe Associate Director of the Moore Institute um, at NUI Galway. I'm delighted to welcome you here today uh, to, to today's webinar. Um, our series this year is on Zoom, as you now know. Um, somebody has said it's a bit like being at a Victorian seance. There's lots of whispering, are you there? Can you hear me? So we hope to reunite body with voice at some point in the future um, at the Centre for Irish Studies by having guests coming to our lectures. But for now, we have to resort to the plan B. So uh, thank you all for being with us um, and for sharing with uh, our ideas and our questions and our comments um, over the coming weeks as well. Um, the other aspect of, uh, that I want to kind of share with you today as well is that this series has really been seeking to foreground early career scholars in Irish studies, uh, new diverse ways of thinking about Irish, Ireland and Irish society. Um, and we've sought to kind of integrate more established scholars in the field with new emerging voices along the way. So I'm delighted that today's session um, is a welcome home and a welcome back for one of those voices, Professor Margot Bacchus, and also another wel welcome back uh, to Irish studies as well to Professor Joseph Valente. Um, so I'm delighted to, to, distinct, to welcome distinguished professor in English and Disability Studies, Joe Valente, and uh, the John and Rebecca Moores Professor of English at the University of Houston, Margot Bacchus, today. And they will be speaking on their newly, newly published book, The Child Sex Scandal and Modern Irish Literature, Writing the Unspeakable. Uh, in 2007-2008, Margot was the Irish American Cultural Institute in UI Galway Visiting Fellow um, at the Centre for Irish Studies, um, where she conducted much of her research on the culture of, of the Irish culture of sex scandal. Uh, this culminated in her 2013 volume, Scandal Work, James Joyce and the New Journalism and the Home Rule Newspaper Wars, uh, published in 2013 by University of Notre Dame Press. Um, and then also, uh, this has also culminated in the work that we're presently going to hear a little bit more about today. Uh, she's also the author of The Gothic Family Romance, um, which won the American Conference of Irish Studies Prize for Distinguished First Book and was recognised as a choice outstanding title. Should be on everyone's reading list. Uh, Joe Valente is, has authored over 65 articles and book chapters and is the author of The Myth of Manliness in Irish Nationalist Culture, uh, published in 2011, Dracula's Crypt, Bram Stoker, Irishness and the Question of Blood, uh, from 2002 and republished in 2012, and James Joyce and the Problem of Justice, Negotiating Sexual and Colonial Difference. Um, in the book today, Margot and Joe are going to uh, share an excerpt from it with you all, and then we'll open it up for discussion afterwards. Um, you're very welcome to put in your questions and comments into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens as well. Um, but just a few words on the book itself um, and on some comments that Fintan O'Toole had, had written about it in his foreword to the volume. Um, in the book, Margot and Joe examine modern cultural responses to child sex abuse in Ireland. Beginning with James Joyce, they offer historically contextualised and psychoanalytically informed readings of scandal narratives by nine notable modern Irish authors who actively and pointedly and persistently question Ireland's responsibilities regarding its children. And through these close critical readings and in the chapters that follow, a more nuanced and troubling account emerges of how Ireland's post-colonial heritage has served to enable uh, such abuse. Um, in his um, forward to the volume, uh, Pinto too makes reference to uh, a series that the Irish Times ran in 2020, from 2020, 2019 to 2020, and it was a year-long campaign called No Child 2020. And it was kind of looking back to the idea of the democratic program, uh, which was initiated by the first Thal in, in January 1919, and the idea of a progressive idea of children being foregrounded and highlighted and privileged and also protected uh, in uh, the Irish state and also in terms of what would become uh, an Irish constitution in different ways. Um, however, as we know, the story uh, unfolded very differently uh, in terms of the aspirations and the practice. Um, and we have now, since the 1990s in particular, a whole series and a litany of abject failures to keep those promises to um, the Irish citizens that are our children. Um, he's also pointed to different ways in which Joe and Margot have sought to uncover um, what is seen as the unspeakable, but also to look at different ways in which we can um, excavate what has been hidden uh, under buried trauma and buried layers of Irish history, whether that's through archaeological excavations, historical excavations, political, socio-economic ex excavations, and excavations indeed on child sex abuse as well that we're all too familiar with, unfortunately, in the west of Ireland as well. 
Um, with this, they use the kind of the, the conceptual framework of, uh, of Jean Laplanche's concept of the enigmatic signifier, which they argue is, is about exploring how sexually uninitiated juvenile nar narrators who can see things they have not yet learned to see. So it's about this idea of how do you unsee something, how do you see something, but then how do you process that as knowledge and information and incorporate it into your, your being as an individual in society. Um, it also brings to mind as well, I've been thinking about this for today, um, Elias Canetti, his idea of being ear witnesses to history. And children often are eavesdropping on adult conversations, they're eavesdropping on things that they hear and then on the you know, newspaper reports, television, radio, car journeys, maybe you know, the top of the stairs at the back of a closed door, um, and how children might not see things or read things in a particular way, but they are ear witnesses to history in a very different light as well. Um, and from my own my own initial reading of of Joe and of of Margot's book, I think they are really foregrounding this idea of children as ear witnesses to um, to a very problematic aspect of modern Irish history um, as well. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Margot, um, and uh, we will have Margot speaking for the first portion of the seminar, and then uh, Joe is going to speak for the second part, and then we'll open it up for general discussion afterwards. Over to you, Margot. Thanks so much, Nessa. Uh, it's great to be back and um, your introduction made me think that I should somehow at least mention that, you know, I think we've just had a story break in the United States about the bones of two children who were um, victims of the bombing uh, in Philadelphia of the MOVE compound in whenever that happened. It seems somehow very close still, but I think it was probably in the 1980s when it happened, and that those bones were kept without um, the children's parents who were still alive being made aware that they had the remains of the children and they were used in teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, so it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, both the knowledge that can be generated through the instrumentalization of children in various ways and in whose, you know, and how that knowledge is used. Somehow, you know, when you said archaeology, I thought, oh God. And I can tell you that the older of the children was a 14 year old girl named Tree Africa, who is remembered by her friends as being the first up any tree right to the top. And that you know, she was completely undaunted. She was very courageous. And just in hearing people who lived with her and remember her talk about her, uh, it persuaded me that it made me feel very personally the loss of that person, as well as the additional loss of using her bones to, as a, you know, as a teaching tool um, without the permission of her parents and presumably not teaching too many people who would have come from the you know disempowered black underclass that the move folks represented. Okay, sorry about that. In Tana French is in the woods, Dublin murder detective uh, Rob Ryan is a narrator who's both sympathetic and in every sense unreliable. And he starts us off by preparing us to receive his account of a harrowing murder investigation gone horribly wrong with the terse caution, I crave truth and I lie. This paradoxical caveat illustrates French's deft use of the police procedural to twist and intensify the dilemma posed to the reader by a narrator whose acute, introspective untrustworthiness uh, in intimates some ethically unsettling parallels between the work of the detective and the work of the author. However, our interest in this chapter is in Ryan's opening, uh, in this opening caveat is actually more literal minded. What we are interested in is um, Ryan's systemic use of mendacity to enforce the law as being one in a series of pointed comparisons between the work of detectives and other officials whose respectable status, income and attitudes operate in the service and defense of the Irish state and the mentality and conduct characteristically identified in the novel with criminal psychopathologies. Um, it is perversely appropriate that the nexus connecting the novels respectively licit and illicit psychopathological performances should also be the primary vehicle of normative and normatively traumatic psychosexual development. 
Um, and this is a very quick overview of our use of the term enigmatic signifier uh, originating in the work of um, French psychoanalyst Jean Laplanche. Uh, parental figures inevitably exude energies associated with their own repressed desires. And in fact, adults in general do this inevitably. Thus, parental figures impart to their children ambiguously eroticized psychic messages encoded material to which Laplanche has given the name the enigmatic signifier. For Laplanche, the introduction of adult sexuality into the child's life horizon elicits a traumatic enjoyment that binds the child um, to its symbolic occasions and thus furnishes the very condition of the child's subjectivity. Because the signifying form is inherit, inherently iterable, the jouissance that is vested in moments of infantile sexual initiation, the encounter with the enigmatic signifier, remains available to be reactivated across a wide array of circumstances. The profound impact of primal libidinal excitation thus proves a contingently renewable resource fueling various manifestations of sexual, sexualized, and sexually tinctured behavior. Moreover, because it functions as a penumbra of undecidability, wherein a certain confusion obtains between the impulses or effective stirrings of the parties involved, the enigmatic signifier is also the primary mechanism of psychosexual misrecognition and manipulation, which can likewise attend along an eroticized chain of association to all other matters of import for the subject in question. What we are calling the psychopathological performances of both the lawmen and the lawbreakers in Tana French's novel represent a subspecies of such beguilement. Here, the profound relationality of desire is drawn upon and exploited in the mood of absolute refusal. That is to say, the radical transferential entanglement that results in the child's traumatic jouissance is reenacted along severed dichotomous lines with the psychopathological agent rising to the imaginary jouissance of a plenary subjectivity by submitting the other party to the trauma of violent objectification or instrumentality. The psychopathology of everyday detective work is so central to this narrative structure of In the Woods that Ryan offers us an illustration of it even before you begin my story, as he says, um, as a framing device, in other words, for the whole. He details the stock interrogation techniques whereby the murder squad detectives mount deceptive shows of vulnerability, empathy, and confidentiality to inveigle their marks while inducing them to mistrust and betray their own friends and confederates. In the case at hand, Ryan begins by flirting with a girl named Jackie, the paramour of a robbery murder suspect. Such flirtation is an exercise in eroticized indefiniteness or undecidable eroticism that pivots on a chain of enigmatic signifiers, vocal tone, suggestive gestures, ocular intensity, um, the imperfect legibility of which turns them into lures, turns these various um, signifiers into lures for desire. Ryan proceeds to engage Jackie in a dialectic of transference, casting himself as an especially avid committed version of her boyfriend. He tells her that he can certainly see why her boyfriend would want to stay home. He would if he uh, had her at home. And by implication, uh, casting her attractiveness as the gravitational force in the colloquy between the two of them. He gives her this taste of sugared erotic agency precisely and psychopathologically as a means of brutally reducing her to a useful object within the fictional scheme her boyfriend has supposedly hatched. Quote, he's claiming that she gave the unmarked bills to him. When, end quote, when Ryan calls this or what Ryan calls this, quote, delicate cross-hatching of discomfort and compassion at her man's betrayal, end quote, encapsulates the performative contradic contradiction at the heart of psychopathology, the proffer of intimacy as a self-interested strategy of dissociation. And it is the enigmatic signifier that facilitates this strategy by veiling its central contradiction that fools a woman like Jackie into believing she figures in the scene as a desiring and desirable subject 
long after she's been relegated to the status of disposable tool. Ryan's deployment of the enigmatic signifier to seduce persons of interest into betraying hidden truths depends on his already assumed or established credibility as an official and as a man. Conversely, it is a sort of double bootstrap. His credibility as an official and a man happens to derive in large measure from a classic repository of the enigmatic signifier, the lilt and grain of the voice in which meaningful verbal encounters register and by which they are ambiguously inflected. Ryan's credibility inheres in his good English accent, um, a particularly valuable social and professional asset in Ireland. The residual influence of that, of what Valente terms the, math of, the myth of manliness lends Ryan's anglicized tonality, an aura of intelligence and competence that's unmatched among the other Irish accented officials around him and of special import accordingly is the way he got this accent. Uh, he got his quote, perfect BBC accent and hence his manly cachet from a boarding school that he only attended in childhood as a refuge uh, and under another name, um, as a refuge from the continuing childhood trauma he incurred in Ireland in the woods at a place called Knocknaree. The vanishing of then Adam Ryan's friends by choice or by force at the prompting of or the hands of another also marks the disappearance of Ryan's own childhood into his adult condition, a departure likewise indeterminably sought and suffered. If French's allusions to Yeats's poem, The Hosting of the She, by way of the novel's mythic locale, not Nari, served to affiliate Ryan's lost friends, Jamie and Peter, with the stolen children of fairy lore, they simultaneously link the psychosexual growth of Ryan, punctuated by this inconceivable rite of passage to the Irish myth of the changeling. On the one hand, the eerie crisis that befalls Ryan on the cusp of sexual maturity banishes him to the woods permanently, in a sense. Allegorically speaking, he remains lodged in the substructure of the national imaginary. Having vanished from public view almost as surely as his friends, he has, like them, run, quote, into legend, into sleepover stories and nightmares parents never hear, end quote. While in the public sphere, reports of their uncanny mishap are still periodically circulated um, by that modern organ of mythology, the tabloid. On the other hand, Ryan has been deracinated losing not only his country of residence, at least temporarily when he's at boarding school, um, and the friends who had been his social ground of being, um, but also his name and his ethnic identity. Um, while his own embedded history is definitively not Norean, he cannot claim it, tell it, or expect it to be recognized as his own. In this respect, Ryan's childhood has indeed been stolen and traumatically replaced by a dissociated adulthood that retains only a haunting, profoundly alienated and alienating trace of his child self. The present Ryan feels continuous not with that prior self, but only with the experience of its disappearance. The Aboriginal Irish Adamite Ryan has been supplanted by an anglicized replicant whose name, Rob, punningly testifies to the enigmatic theft that his manly BBC voice obscures. To say that Ryan undergoes a changeling course o Bill Dung is to say that he straddles the traumatic sejour. He remains in the woods of his childhood dispossession and he has concurrently come out the other side. He lives the ambivalence of a being doubly inscribed in time. And he has been driven to surmount that ambivalence more or less effectively in his daily rounds. Ryan's psychopathological performances as an investigator recapitulate this self-agon. On the one hand, Ryan's shadowy consciousness of catastrophically lost childhood sustains his self-deprecating awareness of the inauthenticity of his accent and the arbitrary mystique that it confers. On the other hand, he finds himself unable to overcome his prejudice concerning the credibility and even the basic worth of various regional gender and class variants closer to the modest social milieu of his noctinary origins than the Tony English boarding school of his adolescence. 
um, painfully uneasy about his own past, as his awkward compulsory Sundays with his parents attest, Ryan repeatedly musters, even while deprecating, his contempt toward the day class A subjects he encounters at work. Under the circumstances, this pattern of self-refuting snobbery seems to represent a projective attempt to override the discomposure of his traumatically staggered subject position. Thus, his ruthlessly manipulative interrogation techniques are not just about ferreting out the truth in others, but refashioning the truth of himself. In entering into, only to repudiate, an effective connection with his lower caste suspects, Ryan forcibly asserts a hierarchical distance from them and in the process from the associations they trigger. His psychopathological forensic performances are thus designed to ratify his status as a, quote, made man, end quote, in every sense. A vested member of the elite murder squad, yes, but also a fully actualized, unassailable male persona. As a new member of Dublin's elite investigations unit, Ryan suffers a certain amount of pro forma hazing, but the general unquestioning acceptance he receives stands in contrast to that unit's collective response to their next addition, Cassie Maddox. Whereas the veteran detective takes his competence of fellow newbie Ryan, at, takes the competence of fellow newbie Ryan at face value, they presume Maddox to be both unqualified and sexually manipulative, um, notwithstanding her demonstrated acumen as an investigator. Her gender, coupled with her youth, serves in their minds as prima facie evidence that she cannot have merited her position. Her youthful female embodiment stands, like Ryan's good accent, as an infallible index of overall worth. Clearly, she has made some kind of illicit use of her attractiveness through seduction, blackmail, or both. It is, in fact, fair to say that Maddox, who becomes Ryan's partner, matches or surpasses his skill in executing the psychopathological performances endemic to their investigative metier, including the deployment of enigmatic signifiers of relationality. However, she is considerably less comfortable with these institutionally prized stratagems. Whereas Ryan views the ruses of police interrogation with self-reflexive irony as an extension of the primary imposture that upholds his entire professional standing, Maddox, uh, for Maddox, the bad faith debriefing of subjects is of a piece with other performative feints and subterfuges required by the gender-based precariousness of her professional position. Um, these include a strenuously nuanced campaign of desexualized self-representation to her coworkers, silence about the legitimate, even admirable grounds for her promotion to the murder squad, um, confirmation of her heterosexuality without palpable emphasis on her femininity or sexual appeal, etc. Unlike Ryan, whose manipulative interview style aims to draw a bright line between the suspect classes in his own community of lawmen, Maddox cannot draw upon a similar sense of tribal solidarity with her peers. And the affective lines inscribed by her manipulative practices accordingly come with a blurred or double edge. Maddox's superb mastery of the psychopathological performance, like Ryan's, derives from a traumatic episode that had a formative impact on her mature personality in the course of her life. On the cusp of adulthood, Maddox fell victim to a full-blooded clinical psychopath with a supremely insidious talent for playing on the affections of his companions. Seizing on the complexities imbuing youthful cross-gender friendships among heterosexually identified subjects, which is a felicitous scenario for enigmatic signifiers, Maddox's colleague abruptly uses the lurking erotic possibilities in their relationship uh, as the pretext for launching a protected slander campaign that results ultimately in Cassie's exile from their social circle on the grounds that she has been sexual, sexually victimizing him by threatening to claim that he has raped her. Uh, having driven her out of the university and by a circuitous route into law enforcement, this ordeal prepares Cassie both to navigate the suspicions of her new circle of associates and the, mur uh, the murder squad and to cultivate the self-doubts of the alleged offenders whom she interviews. On the strength of this experience, Maddox becomes the squad's resident expert on psychopathy. It's 
of unofficial profiler. Thus, it is no coincidence that it is she who most pointedly summarizes the detective psychopath correspondence. Um, she's in talking about the drug dealer that she uh, who stabbed her, thereby qualifying her for the murder squad. She notes, after all, he had a point. I was only pretending to be his friend to screw him over. The novel extends Cassie's analogy to state officials generally who routinely simulate care, solicitude, protectiveness, and outrage for complete strangers, that is voters, who are of merely instrumental concern to them. Ryan speculates that half of all government positions are occupied by psychopaths, and in the novel's climactic scene, the head of the murder squad, O'Kelly, observes with a kind of awe that one psych psychopathic suspect's bent for destructive manipulation suits him perfectly for government work. From its highest authorities to its lowliest delinquents, the Celtic tiger social order on French's portrayal relies on the assumption of an empathy one does not feel, to sell plausible lies one does not believe, to people one secretly loathes in the pursuit of ends diametrically antithetical to their interests and expectations. As the novel unfurls, Nocnery looms as a narrative emblem and national microcosm of this modus operandi. Built just prior to Dublin's belated transformation from a Victorian cityscape catering to a small metro colonial elite and a teeming underclass, the remote Nocnery was touted as a groundbreaking modernizing initiative that would make middle class housing replete with shops and, and movie theaters available to Dublin's burgeoning, ca burgeoning cast of low grade bureaucrats and office workers. If we are to judge by results, however, Nocnery was in fact a highly effective bait and switch scheme whereby politicians conspired with developers to build cheap homes on inexpensive outlying land to sell them at inflated prices using flashy brochures um, that promised a support uh, to support an infrastructure that was never actually to materialize. Um, this essentially predatory collaboration between the state and Irish venture capitalists is recapitulated in the novel's present, in which, so Notnery went up 20 years ago, the kids got raised in it, various things happened um, to various children in the woods of Notnery, which is where the amenities were supposed to go. Um, and then in, in the novel's present, a coalition of anonymous real estate investors and corrupt city councillors reenact the crime of Notnery's inception by forcing the construction of a motorway through the iconic woods adjoining the estate. The novel's motorway controversy is a fictitious counterpart to the real life furor that surged around the Irish state's decision to extend the M3 motorway directly through the Hill of Tara in the first decade of the 21st century. Written during the years when the M3 Hill of Tara uproar was raging, French represents her culturally, historically, socially, and environmentally destructive motorway as a government investor boondoggle that Notnery's residents are powerless to reject or even thanks to threats from the powerful to cash in on for themselves. Um, as becomes clear over the course of the novel's central murder investigation, the corrupt machinations propelling the unwanted motorways construction follow the same pattern of self-interested motives and malevolent intentions hidden behind reassuring expressions of care that are ascribed in the novel to both the skillful to both skillful detection and to the criminal psychopath. The words of the novel's title, the site on which all the housing estate amenities were to be built, contain, or sorry, the woods of the novel's title, contain thousands of years worth of Ireland's lived historical legacy, which a coalition of Notnery residents, archeologists, historians, and concerned citizens have been fighting a losing battle to protect. These woods are also for Rob Ryan, a lost childhood paradise and the scene of that bizarre and unexplained catastrophe that determined the course of his adulthood. Having been marked in the Irish media and social imaginary as the redemptively found child, his two friends disappear forever. No one knows why Rob is found, but does not know what has happened. Um, he is also the survivor of an incomprehensible tragedy that left him tainted, guilt-ridden, and vaguely suspect, um, which is why he is sent to boarding school. 
Uh, the adult Ryan re-enters these mythic woods after workers at an archaeology site desperately working around the clock to salvage artifacts before the construction starts find the body of a murdered 12-year-old girl. These woods are also home to ancient occult dangerous entities, a winged voice creature, a disembodied laughter, the puka that is sometimes blamed for spiriting away Peter and Jamie. Their collective presence is associated not only with the vanishing of Ryan's friends, but with its pre precursor episode witnessed by these same children, um, which is the rape of the Nocknery girl named Sandra by a trio of adolescent boys. One of them, Jonathan Devlin, uh, one of whom Jonathan Devlin grows up to be the father of both the murder victim and the chief culprit. These baffling entities are most properly designated cryptids Monstrous creatures like the Thunderbird, Sasquatch, the Black Dog, or the Puka itself, whose collective existence has been widely attested, but cannot be reliably verified or scientifically proven. In a sense, the cryptid is an existential version of the enigmatic signifier, in that it occupies a zone of indeterminability between a traumatic visitation of the other and an uncanny fantasy of the self, a positive or negative projection of desire. Entangling the appearances and reports of such cryptids with the criminal episodes to be investigated in the woods lends a phatic dimension to their enigmatic function. The cryptids embody the capacity of the horror mystery genre in its more, more sophisticated forms to solicit uh, and to thwart allegorical readings in a single motion. The cryptid figures of In the Woods might be taken to signify the spectral power of the state, capital, the furtive predations of child sexual abuse, or the ineluctable corruption of human relationality by psychopathic energies. But they cannot be definitively affixed to or even affiliated with any of these points of reference. In its undecidability as a symbol, symbolic counter built upon its ontological uncertainty, the cryptid proves an especially apt objective correlative of the novel's signature mode of moral political obliquity. Evil and corruption, the text announces, originate just here at the site of enigma, at the crux of the X, where interpretation is necessary in proportion to irresolubility. Joe, you're up. Okay. All right. Uh... Okay, I am going to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, how the enigmatic signifier and sexualization of the child in the child's uh, development links us to larger social and political issues in, in the woods. And in particular, I'm going to suggest that, that uh, Tana French uses the procedural, the genre of detective fiction, and pushes it in a couple of different directions, towards a novel of manners and towards a historical and political allegory. This begins with the idea of Ryan's, the detective, when he finds the body of the murder victim, finds her identity, Katie. He feels that this is a true anomaly, that children just don't disappear in Ireland. In fact, he says, in all of Ireland's brief disorganized history as a nation, fewer than half a dozen children have gone missing and stayed that way. Now, French invokes such popular wisdom to create added buzz within the story for its lurid central events, but she simultaneously and insistently exposes Ryan's repeated assurances that Irish children are altogether safe as a comforting but egregious lie. 
a self-serving instance of collective amnesia, outstripping thereby the generic conventions he so deftly employs. Scattered across the whole of the novel are numerous other near and quasi-child disappearances that recall the materially, socially, and culturally specific realities that underlie the novel's fantastic Gothic surface. Indeed, French systematically references virtually every category of juvenile disappearance that has been pervasive in modern Ireland. Among these illusions is Maddox's account of her near molestation by a public school custodian, a plausible case of near disappearance. Forcible incarceration and suicide are alluded to in Ryan's recollection of a Knocknery resident named Mad Mick, who was said by Ryan's friend Peter to have made a girl pregnant. Peter told his friends Adam and Jamie that the desperate young woman hanged herself in the woods and that her face turned black, a detail that suggests Peter was giving a firsthand account. After the young woman's suicide, as Ryan recalls, as though from his own firsthand knowledge, one day Mick started screaming outside Lowry's shop and the cops took him away. The incarceration of girls and women in the maudlin laundries and the involuntary removal of infants, infants from their unwed mothers both haunt the birth story of Ryan's other best friend, Jamie. And the murdered girl's father explains that he was a casualty of the 1980s quote, there's a whole generation out there that fell through the cracks. Now, in true Gothic facts fashion, what Maddox does is to present these anomalies, which are in their very recurrence and salience, present them as the key to some disturbingly normative condition. After all, developmentally speaking, the disappearance of children happens all the time as a matter of course, the approved course. It is constitutive of maturation. For its part, sexuality is the component of the maturation process that furnishes its most definitive biological and psychological impress. That is because sexuality is the component that was already channeled and activated in infancy. And as a result, it perpetually har harbors traces in the adult of the vanished child and periodically stages the possibility of the reemergence of that vanished child. Now, it is this aspect of sexual being that proves especially fraught in the property-based societies that French's Celtic Tiger Ireland epitomizes, epitomizes to the point of parody. Under broadly liberal regimes, where the ideal of individual sovereignty and private ownership are jointly enshrined to pass from immaturity to maturity, from citizen apprenticeship to citizen subjectivity is to become one's own person, to come into full possession of oneself as opposed to remaining legally and otherwise at the disposal of others, indentured to others' will. In this context, sexuality constitutes an especially decisive obstacle in the growth process, precisely because it is also, developmentally speaking, the most routinely contested element. At sexuality's origin, as we have seen, lies a profound equivocation vehiculated by the enigmatic signifier between an external solicitation and an interior fantasy, between the traumatic imposition of another's unconscious designs and the enjoyable realization of the self's own nascent desires, between a seductiveness that inheres in the actions taken and a seductiveness that inheres in the interpretation given. This ambiguous nature of infantile sexuality persists even into the relatively secure identity formation of adulthood, where the subject might indeterminately be said to give oneself to and to take possession of the desire of the other. And here we have the key to why psychopathological performances regularly involve forms of sexualized violence, even when they do not as in French's novel, necessarily entail bodily assault. By brutally objectifying, instrumentalizing, and depleting the other, 
These performances look to secure the narcissistic boundaries of the self against the unconscious traces of traumatic inmixing or embarrassment or compromise endemic to infantile eroticism. Psychopathological conduct, in short, sustains the impossible fantasy of plenary self-ownership through the effective, if localized, owning of another. Indeed, the criminal in this case, Rosalind, may only come to be apprehended because she had been so hell-bent on directing her accomplice Damien not only to kill her sister, but also, and in particular, to rape Katie before doing so. She thereby evinces a self-aggrandizing will to instrumentalize her boyfriend and own her sister in the most gratuitously and sexually cruel manner imaginable. We see this same dynamic occurring earlier in the history of Nochnery in the orchestrated rape of Sandra by her boyfriend, Cathal, along with his two friends, which include Jonathan, the, 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 the father of Rosalind. And French has Ryan reflect in his narration on this episode in a manner that clearly, unmistakably recalls Eve Sedgwick's classic work, between men. Ryan discovers in the motivations of the three boys who rape Sandra, a desperate because unadmitted passion for one another. He says, he had been lost somewhere in the wild borderlines of 19, half in love with his friends with a love surpassing the love of women. But if Ryan is able to have this insight, he does not recognize the profound ambivalence at work in the misrecognized and displaced homoerotic attachments that he discerns. And that ambivalence gives rise to psychopathology, the psychopathology of the rape itself. Sexual maturity in the novel tends to endanger the cohesion of cross-gender groups of children because under the broadly patriarchal arrangements and assumptions still operating in Celtic Tiger Ireland, some group members, typically the girls, are shunted from being subjects to being sexual objects, and hence from being partners to being property. This sh shift transforms the remaining group members, typically the boys, into both partners and competitors with respect to the newly ordained property. They are ushered into a decisive homosocial attachment and antagonism, with the antagonism fueled by, but also concealing the eroticized aspect of the attachment. Surpassing the love of women, yet acknowledging only the love of, or the, at least the desire for women, this homoerotic adherence threatens the very heteronormative masculinity it informs. It raises the specter of a certain gender instability at the heart of that masculinity as such, engenders an internal antagonism in the individual boys, experienced as crisis. The erotic fellowship in question does not, as a result, merely surpass the love of women. It overtakes and poisons it. This is the psychopathological dimension of the homosocial dynamic with which Ryan fails to reckon. The group rape of Sandra is literally an effort to deposit the male antagonisms here described in the body of the other. But the rape does more than license the expression of this animosity as sexual violence. In combining Sandra's physical possession by the group with her violent and moral expulsion from the group, the rape offloads and thus assuages that male antagonism in both its interior and exterior forms, salvaging the homosocial affirmation of masculinity at the expense of its female vessel. Or it would be more accurate to say, attempting to salvage, for Ryan himself observes the irony that while the whole point of Sandra's rape was to bring the boys back together, 
it in fact sets them irreparably at odds, as psychopathology will. The homosocial violence in question and in general is all about resolving the, that primal scene of traumatic enjoyment, the enigmatic signifier, which stages a profound confusion of subject and object. Precisely because it is a scene of both wounding and enjoyment, abjection and the accession to subjectivity, this primal scene resists final resolution, or more precisely, it takes its only possible resolution in the form of repetition. No sooner in this case is the masculinity of the boys consolidated, their gender instability settled, and a group cohesiveness resumed through the violent reduction of Sandra from person to property, then the boys themselves are transformed into competitors over that property, menacing the group adhesion anew. Not only does the divisive question of sexual possession threaten to trump the bonds of shared male sovereign subjectivity, it casts doubts on those very bonds. Insofar as masculinity has been identified in the very act of rape with masterful possession, the admission of disputes and degrees of possessiveness among the competitors reintroduces gender instability, reactivates the primal trauma of subjectivity, and releases homosocial antagonism on that basis. Cathal maintains his claim on Sandra as his real girlfriend, and that has the effect of dispossessing both Jonathan and Shane in their very sexual possession of her. Indeed, the gang rape dispossesses them more assuredly than if they never took possession, if taking her had remained a future prospect. Cathal himself proves one of the real, true, clinically diagnosable instances of psycho psychopathy in the novel, and that is surely no accident. As we have seen, psychopathological performance regularly unfolds here as the manipulation of intimacy to secure advantage and aggrandizement. And Cathal's stratagem works not only on his central victim, Sandra, but on his partners in crime as well. The one indisputable and ironic thing to be said about the rape episode is that Cathal alone emerges with his fortunes unscathed and his life prospects intact. He is a, becomes a successful socioeconomic agent in Ireland's new liberal order. If madness might be understood not as an extreme deviation from some absolute standard of rationality, such a standard has never been established anyway, but rather as a dysfunctional departure from the operational norms of a given society, from its forms of life, then Cathal, of all the participants in this squalid episode, is the least mad. His psychopathy, psychopathy in general perhaps, looks like the very antithesis of madness in the commodified world of the Celtic tiger. To the contrary, a psychopathological course of personal bildung from childhood to sexual maturity would seem most closely aligned with and appropriate to the course of national development that incubated in that neoliberal late capitalist beast. If we, well, let's make the last point, and this is the last section of the, of, the, um, of the chapter, it's called psychostate formations. And what we explore in this section is the historical allegory at work in the in the in the the, the novel um and what 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 uh french manages to do is to establish various metaphorical parallels between these acts of sexual violence the larger and the larger narrative context of the crime the main crime both these acts of sexual violence the rapes and the ultimate uh, murder of Kate, Katie, occur in the environment of the heritage dig of Nocnery. And so th th this has got to be a tremendously important thing that you would locate it there. Okay. Now this, this heritage dig is dedicated to the unearthing of Ireland's ancient origins. But the site is also for that very reason, expressive of Ireland's modern roots in the enterprise of revivalism which from the fall of Parnell to the founding of the Republic served to conjoin the cultural nationalism of institutions like the Abbey Theater with the revolutionary nationalism of the Fianna and the volunteers. In this overlap of temporal registers, 
connecting the affect and the act of ethnological discovery, the venue coalesces and monumentalizes the evolution of Ireland from tribal territory confederated by blood and belief to liberal state held together by civic identification and property relations under law. Between the crimes and the scenes of the crime then, there exists an analogy of growth and development, personal on the one hand, among the protagonists, national on the other. Is this analogy more than casual, more than a coincidence in narrative detail? By digging deeper here at Nocknery, so to speak, into the revivalist and revolutionary heritage of modern Ireland, we can see that it is more than coincidence. From the 98 through the Easter Rising to the Anglo-Irish War, Irish nationalists strove to overcome colonial ethno-sectarian divisions and hostility through intensely homosocial paramilitary violence in the cause of reclaiming a country habitually figured as a woman, Shan Van Vox, Spear Bomb, Air, Mother Island, et cetera. In this regard, Sandra's rape retrospectively reenacts in personal terms the gender dynamic of this insurgency, fought by youths loving each other with a love surpassing the love of women, youths whose rebellious assaults likewise ultimately pitted the participants against one another in a civil war rather than consolidating the fraternity they sought. French's odd yet strategic phrase to describe how Sandra's assailants conceived their partnership, she calls it the cause, serves to underscore the allegorical resonance of their seemingly unexampled rite of passage with it, it, with it, with a national history. In her depiction of a traumatic gendered ontogeny recapitulating Ireland's national phylogeny, French fashions the bodies of growing Irish children as ideological sex gendered time bombs destined to burst into adulthood at their own expense. In the decades after the Anglo-Irish Treaty, residual division and animus between capital and labor, landowner and tenant, Anglo and Celt, Protestant and Catholic, gave way to a new crisis of possession and dispossession of the sort miniaturized in the childhood cohorts of in the woods. The Irish underclasses had come following the era of revolutionary struggle to occupy a position that was essentially analogous to their middle-class compatriots or that could be made analogous, analogous in a nationalist rhetoric in which all committed patriots were the valued children of Mother Ireland a condition explicitly invoked in the Easter 1916 proclamation. But as a relatively small insular elite laid effective claim to the cultural heritage of Ireland and on its authority captured the state apparatus, other more populous groups became or remained substantially, if not formally disenfranchised. Their loyalty in turn was retained and national cohesion secured through the displacement of their class subordination, dispossession, etc., onto the women and the children metonymically affiliated with them. A new hegemonic narrative reorganized all of the existing histories of Ireland with reference to a teleology combining masculinist theodicy with middle class triumphalism. The social order reflected in and served by this narrative exploited and instrumentalized women for the twinned purposes of biological and ideological reproduction by mandating their conformity with an ultra respectable desexualized yet maternal ideal of femininity already identified symbolically with the nation itself, Mother Ireland as Blessed Virgin, and soon to be identified legally in the Constitution of 1937. Interlocking arms, the companionate, male-dominated institutions of Catholic Church and Gaelic State ruthlessly disposed of female and juvenile bodies within an architecture of containment, including orphanages, industrial schools, maudlin laundries, and yes, the surveilled family home in order to enforce their moral authority as a political fiat and their political power as morally unimpeachable. For most of the 20th century, the Irish state not only routed vast numbers of women and children into the Irish Catholic Church for training and indoctrination, but also institutionalized those under the same aegis who were understood to have refused such indoctrination or who behaved in any manner deemed contrary to its precepts of morality. National cohesion was thus induced 
under a peculiarly gendered mode of duress, wherein women and children function as what Giorgio Angamben has theorized as the exception. They were, they were included in the symbolic order, but only as the excluded portion, vital agents of social belonging, but only in being deprived of agency. The lineaments of this distinctly gendered predicament reappear graphically in the case of Sandra and virtually in the case of Jamie um, uh, Rob's friend. I just want to, make, want, want to conclude by making one point, and that is that what French has done with Rosalind is a twist that gives rise to uh, uh, or, or that occasions uh, our understanding of a, a mutation that has occurred in the symbolic order. Uh, against Ryan's expectations, the reader's expectations, and the entire historico-ideological groundwork in which those expectations are embedded, the main psych psychopathic villain, like the victim of, an, of the featured atrocity of In the Woods, a rape homicide, is both female and a minor. So instead of making the, the female and the minor just the object of state psychopathy, French flips the script, reverses both the gender and generational coordinates of the fictive and documentary annals of sexual outrage and violence that have magnetized the public imagination of Ireland over the past two decades. From the Murphy and Ferns reports to the Ann Lovett and Curry baby scandals to the maudlin laundries and the recent Tuam mother and baby home disclosures. In all of these cases, the victims of a broader social psychopathy are women and children. Now, this does not mean that French's choice of a homicidal psychopath in Rosalind is intended to allegorize a like reversal in the gendered or generational scheme of dominance that has obtained in the Irish Republic since its inception. In casting so dramatically against type, however, she does prod a reader to apprehend a certain mutation in that scheme, okay? To be sure, the psychopathic tendencies of Rosalind Devlin germinated in the established post-colonial symbolic order with its officially sanctioned and enforced sex gender system. But even as the dimensions of Rosalind's criminal psychopathy depend on the broader framework of Ireland's modern cultural psychopathy, up to and including her insistence that Katie be not just killed but sexually violated and by a man, her brand of turpitude neither aims nor conduces to carrying force forth forward the ideological terms of that cultural psychopathy, nor to reinforcing the gender hier hierarchies that it reflects. Indeed, what renders the disposal of Katie's body at the heritage site so ironic for the reader and so strategically misleading for the detectives is that the violent and vindictive perversity animating Rosalind's sororicide does not align itself by design or by accident with the sexual, generational, and institutional politics on which it is propped, like Katie's corpse, on, on the ancient order, uh, on the ancient altar. So while Maddox and her crew eventually solve the murder, its underlying meaning, the social implications of Rosalind's scheme remain illegible to the very end. Drawing on her prior experience, Maddox dismisses Rosalind's miscreancy as an interiorized and individualized psychic malady, an empathic default at once self-absorbed and self-delighting. A further irony concerning the crime scene, however, extends the novel's historical allegory to situate Rosalind's psychopathy firmly in its cultural milieu, the heritage site on which Katie lies. That heritage site is to disappear imminently under the bulldozer of highway construction at the behest of real estate developers. So in exerting a form of absolute possession and control, Rosalind's murderous sexual violence bears no communal impress or historically shared impetus, yet it chimes metaphorically with the will to possession of the Irish moguls and robber barons determined to screw the Irish community out of any possession or control over the shared history lodged at Knocknery. In the past, crimes that frame the present ones, the gang rape of Sandra and the vanishing of Jamie and Peter, in the woods reenacts the formation of community and violence, specifically the movement of a mythical state of universalized but unconstrained childhood or immaturity 
to the establishment of permanent bonds among citizen subjects connected by guilt and sublimation. In the psychopathological performances of the police interrogation, of which Maddox and Ryan are past masters, In the Woods shows how the monopoly of violence exercised by the state reenact the formation of the modern community or nation along its original exclusionary lines, abjecting and exploiting the usual gender, generational, and class subjects. By this means, infractions against the community are harnessed by the state to legitimate and harden the social hierarchies that form its very foundation. By contrast, while the present felonies at the heritage site tap into those same social hierarchies and feed on the socio-political environment they delimit, these crimes do so for self-aggrandizing purposes at complete variance with the received agenda of the Irish people nation at large, symbolized by the site itself, or even of its legal and institutional manifestation, the state apparatus. At the same time, the male factors pursue those antisocial ends with either the intentional cooperation or the inadvertent connivance of the state officials in charge. That is to say, here the transgressions harness state power to legitimate, in the case of the developers, or to exculpate, in Rosalind's case, their infractions. The script is flipped in both crime and punishment. In the early in the earlier scenarios we flagged, individual psych- psychopathic performances metaphorize the insanity of state practices of self-preservation and aggrandizement. Personal psychopathy stands as a microcosm of cultural psychopathy. Conversely, this climactic pairing of illicit activities, two different versions of rape murder, features psychopathological performances that are emblems backing of public institutions to private interests diametrically opposed to any communally approved good whether it be the success of a local child celebrity like Katie or the conservation of prized heritage sites. This mutation in the symbolic order, which In the Woods looks to narrativize in all of its complex transactional relations to the original Gallo-Catholic genome, is an Irish species of neoliberalism born in but surviving beyond. Celtic tiger here. Thank you. That's all. That's all I got. Thank you very much, uh, Joe <laughs> and Marco. Um, and uh, we might just move to kind of a more general discussion now, if that's, that's okay with you guys. Um, so thank you so much. I mean, it was a wonderful kind of deep dive into the, your book and also into Tana French's book as well. Um, and her some of her books were actually serialized um, on TV as well recently in Ireland. I don't know if you've got a chance to see that. Um, if you want to put your, I think you're on mute there, Marco, as well. Um, so um, I just want to ask you both, um, I might start with you, Margot, um, what was the process that led you to select the text that you chose? I mean, you're looking at a broad range of material from Joyce um, right up to Anne Enright and, and beyond. Yeah, it was really organic. We had some things in mind very early on that we did not end up incorporating. Um, we really wanted, we, we were very definite about down by the river and we did not include down by the river um we really wanted um to and it would have made great sense to end with emma donahue's room um and we didn't do that but it is interesting i think i was really blown away by by in the woods although we went back and forth between in the woods and um the likeness uh and uh you know, and it kind of flipped a coin, which is how I always feel about those two novels, because um, they're both great, each in its own kind of way. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest answer that I have um, for my devotion to In the Woods is because when I was in Galway, you know, the protests were happening at, um, you know, at the Hill of Tara. And, you know, there were flyers around. And in particular, I vividly remember there being flyers saying that the radical fairies were turning out at Tara to protest. And the radical fairies have always been like a personal kind of spiritual um, (laughs) love object of mine. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) And I didn't ever go. I didn't ever turn out. I was busy, you know, getting one more day in the library or whatever. And so, 
you know, it ultimately felt like a payment of a kind of, you know, a very tiny little payment of a debt that, um, and I was very happy that we were able to include it. It's, it's, it's think, really interesting. Yeah, sorry, Joe. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, um, I think that, 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 that there, the books were chosen for different reasons. Okay. Um, that is, I think that we could say that we were always going to do the Joyce. We were always going to do the Country Girls. And we were always going to do the Gathering. I think those three we were always going to do and, and that, that they, were, they were more programmatically chosen. I think that, I think that other, other books came up and, and we started thinking about them. And if we the fact that we actually, I think the fact that we made, we made arguments about them determined the fact that they would be included. Right. Yeah. And so in the woods, an argument opened up that was different than any argument anywhere else in the book. Um, and, and to some extent, it's not an argument uh, the, the lines of the argument are different than, than, than usual lines of argument, um, uh, particularly about procedurals. So that sort of, and, and the same thing with Land of Spices. It, it, it's sort of like we opened up and like, oh my God, you know, everything about the enigmatic signifier fits here. And so, so you know, and, and I think that, I think that um, then there, there, there also was the, the point that what we do in the book is, is, is pretty granular. We, you know, I actually think what, what it's both big, we have, we have a big picture, and then we take that big picture and we, so, but that takes, that takes pages and pages. So, <laughs> so that means that, you know, you can't do everything that you want to do. And so down by the river is like, okay, well, we we're, we're committed to country girls. We're not going to do two novels by the same person. So down by the river, although it does, it does get actually a kind of significant mention in the book. It's not that it, it's not, it's, not, it's got not completely obscured. Um, it does get a significant mention in the book. And so, and, and secret scripture, I mean, we've done a subsequent article on secret scripture um, in um, that Routledge collection, I uh, forget the name of the international something or other. It's got a very administrative bureaucratic title. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, it's an um, excellent volume, I'm sure. <laughs> it is an excellent volume. No, it's, yes. I think it's, and, and the cover is brilliant and beautiful and aesthetic. And then the title is like, you know, like it came out of a, yeah, um, a commission somewhere. Um, um, and, but so we do a little bit of secret scripture. We have a, we have a section of that in the, I think in the introduction, um, but you know, we don't do a full thing because, because of, of time. And then room is a special case. I think that room, the, the, the non-inclusion of room is, is a special case. Uh, that, that, I, I, that would have taken a, a, a really a full chapter onto itself. And I think we would have had to work out some disagreements about the novel, which, which, you know, um, which is actually sure. always very good for us when we have. It to is always that. very good for us, but it it's also been brilliant if we'd had the energy. Yeah, and right. But, I mean, that's how we work. Actually, we yeah. collaborate by by disagreeing with one another, you yeah, know, yeah. and then and then finding ways to, you know, in, in it's almost classic Hegelian fashion, finding a kind of a, a dialectic out of the initial the initial uh, thesis antithesis yeah, collision. Yeah finding a finding finding a way finding a way forward um mm. so that you know so that we can both be right <laughs> <laughs> of course you know two, two separate opinions don't necessarily mean that you're both wrong you know? right right so, but, we, um, but, but we actually form it into a new opinion that that validates the 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 rightness of the separate opinions that are that are now somehow incorporated yeah, yeah, absolutely. I suppose I was, I was really interested as well and taken in, you know, your choice with Tana French because of the genre of the detective novel as well. Um, and, you know, the kind of the different kinds of privileging of writing and literature in Ireland as well in terms of what's high literature and what's seen, you know, big serious fiction, chick lit, detective novel, you know, crime noir. And I think Irish writing has moved so much more oh, it's much more open now in terms of you know seriously thinking considering how it engages with Irish culture and society through different genres so it doesn't have to be the particular kind of the you know the Irish novel is different now and Tana French is a case in point I think you know I think that also I would say also that that I mean I'm, I'm not saying that this is a causal factor but it, it's a causal factor for me um, that that psychoanalysis is as, has been really good um, in its in its later developments in you know absolutely ratifying 
the seriousness of literature that was not taken seriously or of film that was not taken seriously. I mean, the, the, it, you know, so psychoanalysis has, has a way of getting to the seriousness of things whose status within pop culture, you know, tends to relegate them to the, to the, to the periphery of, mm -hmm. of, you know, of, of, of highness, you know, yeah. and, and, yeah. and I think that, that, you know, what, what we found with Tana French is that this is this, you know, certainly take it from a psychoanalytic uh, point of view, which I don't see how you cannot take in the woods from a psychoanalytic point of view. I mean, um, yeah. In the yeah. woods is almost a psychoanalytic metaphor in and of itself. Um, uh, it, it just explodes with, with, you know, kind of layered uh, uh, significance that's, that's, I think, really quite remarkable. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one of the things, I, I want to say one of the things we do in our book, I think, is we really celebrate these novels. I mean, there, there's serious critical analysis going on. I mean, you heard it. I mean, we, we do stuff pretty much in depth. But it's like, we love these novels. And, and, mm -hmm. and we, are, we are in the business of, of, of promoting them by taking them very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of connection as well, Margo, I might pop over to you now, if that's okay, yeah, um, well, in terms of the interconnection between other kinds of discourse. So you're bringing in that discussion of the public sphere of what's happening on the outside, you're bringing in the journalism, and you make that reference, I think, in the Anne Enright chapter, um, you know, where it's, you know, one of the characters is saying, well, I wouldn't have thought about this only that I'm hearing it on the radio, I'm reading it, in, you know, in, in the newspapers. So you have that kind of that openness to different kinds of discourse that's also coming into your book. Yeah, that was sort of part of this. It was a very rich experience, ultimately, you know, having the room to ask questions about, like, how different discourses are, are speaking to each other and affecting each other. And, you know, it was really only fairly late in the game, you know, that I realized that a really important claim we are making is, um, you know, because I mean, leftists are accustomed to saying like, the thing I study has meaning, the thing I study has agency, it is doing something, you know, whether we're claiming it's doing something bad or something good. But, um, but it seemed late, you know, late in the game, like, wow, this persistence of, on the part of Irish authors in making visible a whole sort of strata of unspeakable experience mm -hmm. that is shaping public reactions to accounts of any, a variety of scandalous accounts or outrage accounts, outraged accounts of anything that sort of pulls together in any, in a variety of configurations, the child, the sexual, and you know, and some some version of moral risk, you know, or moralized risk or um, imperilment, and that 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 is such a powerful way of framing things that putting a child at moral risk um, in a in a powerful story that also accesses the enigmatic signifier, so that an entire population radically reorients itself around who is the who is the problem and what must be done you know you can, you can do a lot of harm very fast yeah. with an account like that so yeah I really I loved being able to see more especially how this literature has really worked in tandem with work that has also been done by journalists cartoonists feminist activists, all kinds of groups, you know, like it really brought a kind of to light, a kind of alliance politics out of which ultimately the alliance politics that brought us, you know, the marriage referendum and the abortion referendum. And here, and, and, he, and here we have a point, and here we have a point where, 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 where our, our interests completely diverge, not completely, but substantially <laughs> diverge, um, which is that for me, the book was always about what, and, and it entailed, you know, this kind of in, interdiscursive negotiation, but it was always about what is it that literature, qua literature, does distinctively? What does it do? How does it, how does it operate a language and with a language and use a language 
um, in, in ways that you don't find other responses to outrage and atrocity. I mean, how, how does, you know, how, how does it engage outrage and atrocity? How does it engage scandal um, uh, it, that is specific to its, to, to its, its genre of being? I think it's interesting as well that, you know, historians and some of our best friends are historians here, um, but that how historians are also beginning to look at, at fiction and at literary works and, and other kinds of artistic works to look at things that aren't in the archive, that aren't officially documented in particular ways to uncover hidden traumas or silences, you know, in, in Irish history. And that's not just in Ireland, that's in many countries as well. Um, Trevor Hope quite, has a question. I was just about to go to okay. it. Yeah, I just, yeah. I was just saying, Super. I, I've read it and I've been. <laughs> yeah. So, do you, so the question is just looking at the connection between um, the traumatic ambiguities of the induction of sexuality in the child and the conventions of the detective narrative. So, um, Joe, do you want to go for that thing as you were you were thinking about it? Um, yeah, I, I think that that um, the 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 process bears certain kinds of analogies, right? That, that is the uncovering of whatever sexual uh, uh, secret process uh, uh, enigma, enigma at the heart of psychosocial development and the, 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 the protocols of detective fiction as as means, right? I think really align with one another and 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 enable someone like Tana French to do what she does. On the other hand, he refers to who done it, right? And that that speaks to the kind of genre fiction uh, assumption, which is that a solution will be found, right? That you will so and so has committed the murder, and there you are. Right. Um, and that's what you're looking for. Who did it? Mm -hmm. Who did it? Mm -hmm. And obviously, Tana French is not. I mean, she'll give you who did it, you know, and 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 the, but what's important is what's the meaning of the fact that this person, this this minor female character in particular with this particular psychopathological bent, what is the meaning within the 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 environment that that she did it? Now that it seems to me answers to the need to exceed the who done it uh, paradigm if mm -hmm. detective fiction is going to be answerable uh, to psychoanalytic inquiry because psychoanalytic inquiry, as Trevor Hope suggests, there's there's repetition, compulsion, and acting out. And he says there's working through. Uh, I, I say there's analysis, terminable and interminable, in which in, in, you know a title of a, an essay by Freud, in which it was clear that analysis interminable was the winner in that particular in that particular set of options. <laughs> right? That is that that there is no final resolution of the enigma. Right, there are more or less functional ways of coming to grips with it without being able to solve it. Right, and that's something that I think it, ordinary detect Mickey Spillane detective fiction, um, even Dashiell Hammett selects uh, uh, detective. I'm not sure it gets there, which is why we suggested at one point. And I don't think Margot got to that line in her reading, and it's and it's a particular particularly it's a it's a line I particularly favor so I, I think I will I, I think I will read it um, uh, it is precisely French's narrative strategy the intertwining the exposure of private and public outrages so as to peg them as analogous outcroppings of a morally unsound political economy it's precisely that that raises in the woods from the roles of genre fiction to the dignity of a novel of manners. And I think that that's something that happens in, in Katana French is that, is that she explores, she's able to see within genre fiction, the possibilities of other, of other modes like historical allegory and, and like comedy of manners. So that, so that her, her way of working through it within the within the detective fiction is a working outward it seems to me and 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 providing a, something like generic hybridity if you will yeah margo okay margo 
Um, I, first of all, uh, Joe, I wanted to introduce you to Trevor, who's a, a beloved, long time, long lost friend uh, who is uh, joining us from Turkey. So I'm particularly uh, you know, happy to have him here. Um, and uh, the two of you would definitely get along very well. Um, and I wanted to just say that I think that, be, that the overdetermination of closure in the, you know, in the detective and or the um, procedural, um, you know, that, and the sort of directedness of, you know, of and toward closure actually, you know, sort of, can activate in the hands of, you know, a Tana French or um, a Benjamin Black, you know, um, can, um, can be used specifically to point us, you know, more along the kind of trajectory of the interminable, you know, um, mm -hmm. that there are things to be found out and that these things that we find out are important and valuable, but that we can actually kind of only find them by, um, by, at, by breaking with the kind of invisible, you know, conventions that hold us along a particular trajectory. So I think there's something, you know, really beautiful and interesting and, you know, both, you know, intellectually important and politically important going on through the, you know, sort of deliberate violations of convention and, and this also sort of feeds back a bit to um, another thing that came to me as we were presenting this stuff um, about why we chose this article, which or this novel, which is that this novel has by far the weirdest, you know, sort of um, staging of a kind of childhood trauma, right? That of any, I mean, I think I would dare to say of any that we could think of, I mean, room, presents a different thing in that it's like the scope of the kind of abuse that it stages is so enormous, it's in such an, an enormous level of violation at every level in unthinkable ways. It's being born into the midst of a sex crime, you know, as a prisoner in the midst of a sex crime that entirely defines your epistemology um, is, is spectacular, but this sort of does it the other way, right? By creating a, a impossible sex crime or an impossible trauma, a trauma and, and thereby, right? Do creating a situation where we can see a trauma as inexplicable in ways that trauma is always inexplicable, you know? Um, at the same, at the same. Experiences it. At the same time, pinning it so, pinning it so, so unmistakably to Ireland. I mean, it's it's the one it's the it's the it's the one novel in which in which the 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 crime doesn't just occur in Ireland among Irish people, but is you know is actually located on a heritage site and and asks you uh, the symbolism asks you quite specifically to make the connection to 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 find the lines of communication between a whole vast archive of 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 national legacy and a disposed body right um, i mean this, it's, 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 it kind of comes back to your earlier comment as well about the kind of you know how the, the books and come out of a particular society so joyce and you know the, you know think of you know the short stories in dubliners and all of the different kinds of hidden references there to you know to hidden traumas physical traumas sexual traumas and sexuality in different ways up to then, and Edna O'Brien, again, another case in point as well, um, uh, you know, in terms of how the books emerge out of a particular period, but also then they have an impact on the society as well. People talk about them um, and they're actually talking about, you know, how they're making them think about things differently or think about Irish society differently as well. And I come back to Tana French, because you know, obviously it was the topic of the day. The, the one thing that struck me that I hadn't really thought about, again, just listening to you reading um, again, is that it's in a way it's all about all these, this kind of idea of liminality and these kind of boundary crossings and transgressions and so many different levels. Um, and that the violence on the body is the violence to the body politic. But, and then because it's on a heritage site, this is a violence that goes back for generations and millennia, one could argue. Um, it, how do you think the Tana French is doing that differently maybe to some of the other authors you've looked at? Or, or do you think she's, de like she's deliberately 
citing it in that position. So it's the contemporary moment of Celtic Tiger Ireland and the destruction of the I do, I do think that she's more past. I do think that she's more concerned than well, obviously, the, 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 as you say, these novels exist at different historical periods, and 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 therefore they're they're engaging liminality in in different in different ways. I mean, for example, Joyce is engaging liminality in a in a in a metro colonial state, a state that's both you know part of the UK and 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 that liminality that 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 this possession of an assured identity position haunts the characters of Dubliners and 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 Ulysses for that matter. Um, so that liminality works differently. But I think that in terms of contemporary novels, um, I, I think Tana French is most, you know, she's very, very concerned with the Celtic tiger as a kind of macro socioeconomic formation, right? So you get importance of Celtic Tiger in say the gathering, right? Where you where where um Veronica's role as some kind of magazine maven of interior decoration um um you know clearly speaks to a kind of consumeristic culture that is in, is engaged in some way with the with the problems of sexual abuse. But Tana French really has because she's using because she has Cathal, who's the, the arch psychopath, is also this very, very, very successful economic agent. Because she's using the not just the heritage site, but the idea of bulldozing it by real estate development. She is so concerned with the macro socioeconomic formation of the Celtic tiger and bringing that to bear on the, the intimacies of uh, sexual relations, uh, triangulated social groups, uh, sexual crimes, etc. So I, I do think that the, the liminality, in, in some sense, there's there's it's 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 a, 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 there's more multiple layers because she is her, her endpoints, you know, her 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 limit points, the macro here, the the interior of the body here are 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 so, you know, there's there's such a there's such a, a, a wide separation there. Why, why? I, I think I think it's right. oh, Margot. Yeah, and we will finish up shortly. I know people need to go to have their, their dinner. No, I'm sorry, we're wearing people. No, it's great. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say I I think it's quite important to say that Tana French is doing both and in terms of looking at you know sort of lines of um, you know of influence causal causality that go you know far back because one thing she's also absolutely doing is um, pushing hard against um, assumptions of, you know, atavism, basically. I mean, she couldn't, you know, she, nobody could have made David Lloyd prouder, I'm sure, than her setting the reader up to, you know, find this child sacrificed on a, you know, primitive altar, you know, that in a way that just really is set up to be this kind of reenactment of like the Seamus Heaney bog people poems, like here we got it, you know, the old man killing districts are back at it. And, yeah. um, and then to pull that completely out from under us, completely. And so does she, I- Does, does she pull it completely out from under us though? Hmm? Or uh, does she pull it completely out from under us, though, or does she locate an out of the, the, the does she locate the atavism in the Celtic Tiger? I mean, I, I mean, I think that I think that psycho I think that psychopathy is a highly atavistic. I'm just saying I think psychopathy is a highly atavistic um, uh, uh, mode of being in the world. Yeah. No, I guess that is quite. True. In fact, one of the things I noted down when you were giving a definition of psychopathy is that it probably would be res highly responsible to talk about psychopathy as sort of on a continuum with, um, you know, with sort of pathological narcissism and then with like normal narcissism, right? It's like we, you, we would not, a person who has no narcissism would not, would, would not lead a very satisfactory life and would not um, function. I don't know that you could function very well in the world without a certain amount of narcissism that allows you to feel like I want to be admired and do things. Because if you don't have, I mean, it's almost like you wind up with sociopathy at the other end as well. Like, I don't care what people think of me. So therefore I will do whatever I want and explain it however I want, you know, could be a description of somebody who has zero, you know, sort of self-regard, zero ego. 
Um, mm. Perhaps, I don't know, or I guess zero super ego. But um, anyway, uh, I think that, um, you know, if we think of these things as on a spectrum, yes, absolutely. We are all born into the world facing all the same challenges. You know, we want, we want and expect love and the world is in various ways for all of us disobliging in supplying that in the amounts and to the degree that we would like. And we all develop certain strategies for like how to like, you know, how to fight back against that or how to like, you know, work around it or whatever it is we choose to do. And to a certain extent that's normal. And then beyond a certain extent where it starts to solidify into a set of demands that promote our needs and wants above those of everybody around us and to find ways to try to subordinate other people systematically to those needs and wants, we're moving, you know, we've moved full on into, you know, the, the, the realm of the narcissist and we become the people that, you know, online, you know, TED talks are being given all the time about how to spot and not get into relationships with. And then ultimately, you know, we move into this kind of Donald Trump code red, you know, like person who, you know, really has the capacity to try and, you know, completely subordinate everything within his, you know, range of comprehension into, you know, a story that has no other purpose than to aggrandize him. Um, so yeah, I guess that's atavistic. Right. I mean, all of that is the struggle with that comes from being a very big brained mammal that gets born apparently a trimester too early. <laughs> it's, it's actually interesting. I was and we'll finish up shortly, but I was teaching this book um, there, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was published around the same time as Tana French's book, Country of the Grand by Jared Donovan. But in that uh, central, it's a short story collection. And it's one of the first short story collections about Celtic Tiger Ireland. Um, and uh, Joseph O'Connor wrote a really good review of it in The Guardian when it came out. Um, he talks about Carmageddon in Ireland and it's like this neoliberal kind of culture. But in the central story called Archaeologists, um, it's, the, it's a motorway is being created between Dublin and Galway, uh, which is actually the real motorway that was being created. Oh. And it's set about these two archaeologists who are on site for the National Roads Authority and they come across a bump um, that has to be surveyed. And it turns out to be um, a grave. Um, but it's over two and a half thousand years old, but it's the grave of a child. Um, and it's really interesting that it's in this period when there are physical excavations happening because of all the road building, people say, you know, the whole island of Ireland is an archaeological site, but they're discovering things along the way, whether it's ancient history or more recent history, as in with Tana French. All of these bodies are coming up. So it's not just the Seamus Heaney bog body scenario, it's other bodies are coming up. It's really interesting, I think, that a lot of writers are looking at this during that period as well. Um, but you. it also kind of, yeah, I mean, it goes into this kind of layering thing. And again, it's the Seamus Heaney thing, you know, that, you know, there is no solid ground. Like, you know, it's the atavistic argument, you know, how far down do you go? There is no bottom. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it I reminded then as well of um, Declan Kybert, the following year, 2009, wrote this article, which then became his book called After Ireland. So it was in 2009 in the Irish Times, where he just says, you know, where have the core values of Irish nationality gone? The Irish language jettisoned, Irish Catholicism jettisoned, the idea of the Irish state jettisoned with the Good Friday Agreement. So what's left? And he's, he's again, he's looking at when you peel it away, what, what's actually there? And, and that's why I'm kind of fascinated by Tana French, because I think she's actually hit on something that a lot of other contemporary writers haven't. Um, and that I think you're right, Joe, in terms of looking at what, what she does with the excess of the detective genre allows her to do things that other more traditional and uh, literary uh, fiction writers have actually been weirdly been more constricted with the, the genre of the novel in a way. Um, so I think there's a, there's, there's a huge amount there. And I had finally, I had a wonderful MA student a number of years ago who wrote her MA thesis on, on Tana French and she called it Emerald Crime, which was a fantastic title for her thesis, which is available at the NUI Galway Library. So if anybody <laughs> wants to read that. So um, I'll just take just any final comments yourselves on, maybe I'd just like to ask you just about the process of collaboration and writing together um, as a, a writing couple. Um, how was that? And, um, and you know, is it something that you enjoyed doing? You agree, you disagree, your thesis antithesis and all of that? Yes, um, to and, all of those. <laughs> <laughs> and why, I suppose, why, why did you decide to do it as in collaboration? That's a really good question. Yeah. Th that, well, is we... actually, that is actually, well, I've, I, I don't know, you know, how did that collaborate? I mean. Vicky Mahaffey told us to. 
Well, that's true. We were. I'm glad she did. That's, I know. That's true. Too. That's, that's how we started. Sure. That is how we started collaborating. That huh. that although to be to, to to be fair, she didn't tell us to. Right. Joe right. told Vicky that that's what he. She, that she, like. she, Vicky was doing a <laughs> Vicky was doing a book called Collaborative Dubliners, which is a collection of essays, uh, each yeah. one written by two people. Yeah. The book, by the yeah. way, is dedicated to me. I just want to say that because I'll never have another book dedicated to me. So I just want to put that <laughs> anyway, she so she said, you know, tell me tell me what story you want to do and and who you want to write with. So I said an encounter. I said Margo. And so um, that's how that's actually how it started. And then we had like we had like great fun doing it. And we were sort of in a Joyce mode. And then we we the next thing we did was was Joyce. But it was also it, it was like an article. And we still weren't writing a book, although it became yeah. a chapter in the book. And, and yeah. but that's really where we got into the enigmatic signifier. Um, okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and but, yeah. Even by the time we got to Land of Spices, we were still writing. We wrote another article. Right, At, right. By the time we were getting that article placed, I think, I don't even remember which one of us said it, but I think it was just like, we seem to be writing a book. Mm. So, mm. I think so it was a very natural book. evolving kind and it, of thing. And it then. may either have been as we were getting the Land of Spices placed or else it was at a moment when we didn't have a next thing. I think the gathering was probably the thing that, that actually sort of cemented it. Like looking, you know, I think- I think Once we started doing the gathering, we definitely said, this, is the, this, is, the, this is the last chapter. This, yeah, is, yeah. this is the yeah. culminating chapter. The culminating chapter yeah. will be The Gathering. I, I mean, uh, I think The Gathering is the best novel written in Ireland since Ulysses. I say that all the time and I continue to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I, beg to, I beg to differ, but that will be a different seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I see there's a little kitty cat there. I, I think I might have small children scratching on my door looking okay, for their dinner let's, shortly. But let's not, let's not neglect the children that's and okay that's better. okay <laughs> but, <laughs> but um talk about but not i want to say thank you both so much for a wonderful webinar today and for being part of the art study seminar series um and again this will be uh, this is recorded and we're delighted to have um people guests that are here with us today but also people will be watching it afterwards and, and again the idea we were talking about this before we started today and um, the idea these will be also teaching tools that can be used afterwards can be incorporated into um, your curriculum um, and I said to Joe and to Margo that their book is now on our reading list for our students next year along with this webinar as well so thank you all very much indeed I just want to say also it's just thanks to David Kelly um, and to Professor Dan Carey at the Moore Institute for co-hosting the, the webinar series um, this semester um, and just two more dates for your diaries um, and now people are still kind of mostly working from home so you've, you've escape so that's all good um so we have our next webinar our third one in the series is next week next thursday at 4 p.m irish time um and it's uh she he got got this air out of the night environments of irish music um and it's our wonderful trio of recently graduated doctoral students are going to speak um on their their new uh, emerging research in irish music studies so dr maliki egan dr michael lyden and dr rory mccabe um, and we have a guest respondent uh, from the Department of Creative Arts, Media and Music from Dundalk Institute of Technology. Dr. Anne-Marie Hanlon is the respondent to that session. It will be chaired by uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. May Fjorhan. Um, and then our fourth webinar and our final one for the series, we're going to go to Voices Further Afield in Montreal, Canada. So we're going to be visiting our colleagues and friends in Concordia University. And um, that's on Wednesday, the 26th of May at 4 p.m. And uh, we will have uh, Kelly Nora Drucker, who's the Michael Smith Foreign Study Scholar, um, and she's a humanities doctoral scholar at Concordia University. And um, she'll be speaking about um, her work called Naming the Traces, Reconstructing an Irish Canadian Family Narrative of Immigration, Placemaking and Return. Um, she's looking at reconstructing her grandmother's journey from Shrew County Mayo to Montreal, um, and then also this kind of journey that she that Kelly is going through herself as a as a writer and a poet, and um, so it's life writing engaging with micro histories of the migrant emigrant story, um, and we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Barbara Lorzgowski who uh, is in the Department of History um, of Concordia. It will be the respondent to that session as well. Um, so that'll be the kind of the, our last webinar of the series, and again foregrounding 
fantastic new emerging voices in Irish studies um, with more established figures and pushing the field, exceeding all expectations as always, um, and uh, pushing the field further along uh, with everybody along the way. So I want to say thank you all very much, uh, Gormila Mahogi Galair, and uh, we'll see you all again on the 6th of May. Okay, Sloan. Thank you so much, Nessa. Thank Thanks, you. Nessa. Bye, thank everybody. You.